when I see the robot can't take it. That's not the kind of stuff we're talking about. We're not talking about silicon chips on the end of the probe. One of the biggest problems with electronics out in radiation zones is that the chips, all of those components, just can't take it. In our case, we don't have electronics out in the harsh environment. We only have a chunk of metal and glass that's really just supposed to sit there so we can shine light through it. We'll be talking about the development of online monitoring tools for molten salt reactor systems. I am Dr. Amanda Lines. I work at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and I and my team work on developing online monitoring systems uh, for the nuclear fuel cycle in general, though the talk that I gave today was focused on our work um, supporting molten salt reactors. Thanks for agreeing to have a little interview with me to supplement your presentation. How did you get into molten salt reactors? We started originally by applying our technology to pyroprocessing conditions, um, where pyroprocessing is of interest as a method for recycling used nuclear fuel. There are so many opportunities that molten salt reactors represent, not only producing energy, but producing heat that can go towards supporting other chemical processes or perhaps even generating hydrogen if you want to support fuel cells. There's the generation of medical isotopes. If you design recycling systems like several companies I think are out there um, talking about doing, the tools that we're developing are enabling not only our understanding of the corrosion process and how we can control and optimize for that so we can improve the lifetime of our vessels, but they're providing tools just so that we can understand the salt chemistry in and of itself. And understanding that is a very important pathway towards building the future molten salt reactor. There are certainly some really great design options right out there right now, but I mean, you can even look at the MSRE and compare that to designs today and the advancements that were made simply because of the understanding that was gained on the MSRE. On our team, we tend to focus on chemistry questions. Is uranium present? How much uranium is there? What oxidation state is it in? What type of speciation is it exhibiting? Is it playing with anybody else in the pool that it should or should not be playing with? And to answer those types of chemistry questions, really one of the best tools that we have out there is optical spectroscopy. It's all about taking a fiber optic out to your system, shining light into your system, and looking at how that light interacts with your system. We're actually building tools that can be used to monitor uh, the salt itself as well as the off-gas coming out of a reactor. The ultimate goal is to provide chemical characterization of what's in there. So in the salt, for example, how much uranium, what oxidation state is it in? Um, and in the gas phase, you know, answering questions like is iodine present or other fission gases of interest. PNNL and ORNL are working to develop an off-gas treatment system for molten salt reactors. From providing a route to capture the radioactive species that escape the salt into the gas phase to providing us an alternative route to characterizing what's going on in the salt by looking at the gas that's coming off of it. How many probes would you put in a reactor? Would they be in every little part of the salt loops? And does this reflect a cost factor for a molten salt reactor system? For example, let's talk about one of the companies who want to set up a processing loop so mm -hmm. that they can harvest medical isotopes. You know, in that case, in that processing loop where their goal is to remove those medical isotopes, you'd want a probe before the process and after the process. That way you can see the isotopes going in and you'd be able to see what's coming out. Did you harvest everything effectively? And so on. So it's all about putting tools into the system that meet the needs you have. If you're looking to, let's say, maintain accountancy of your uranium or plutonium in there and it's a loop, I mean, you're gonna have to have probes in a couple places just to make sure that you're capturing what's going on. The good news is that there are a lot of different probe types and a lot of them are being pretty efficiently designed to have pretty small footprints. So it is something that in theory you could work in without having to add a huge chunk of space needs to your, your molten salt reactor system. Glass probe and fiber optics and computing, I mean the computing processing is cheap. Let's say a Raman spectrometer. That's probably going to run in the, the 50K realm. Um, the probes and computing equipment and fibers and all of that jazz, that's probably going to be maybe another 20, 30K. The real cost is going to be in the analysis package. So you can put any system you want online and it'll give you a ton of data, but data is not necessarily something that operators can use. That's pretty 
highly specific stuff there. What operators want is information. So the big, big lift is building your analysis package that can take that data you're collecting online and turn it into the information that operators can immediately understand and use. So that's the real heavy lift. That's the type of thing that uh, my team at PNNL does. We build those data analysis packages. Oh, that is funny. I didn't think it'd be software. I thought it'd be hardware. <laughs> PNNL, we're developing a molecular monitoring approach, an approach that can give us information on species like HF, I2, T2, DF, so on. So those molecular species. At ORNL, Christian and his team are developing an elemental form of analysis. So it can give you things like total iodine, total chromium. And when you combine the molecular and the elemental, what you get is a comprehensive or complete understanding of what's actually in your gas stream. I've heard the idea postulated have these online mo monitoring systems and the data from them actually heads straight to IEA. So it's like remote monitoring of reactors in other countries. Let's say you go talk about the pharmaceuticals or the food industry. They use online monitoring all the time in those systems, and a lot of them do set up networks so that somebody in some headquarters somewhere can check in on some plant and see what the online monitoring results are for that given plant. That technology is available and is already being used in other fields. So for example, if we were monitoring the salt, um, one of the things we might be going after is quantifying the amount of uranium or plutonium or other species within the salt. If you can do that online and in real time and get a comprehensive look at what's going on in your process, that's a good way of maintaining accountancy of all the material in there and ensuring that you can safeguard it appropriately. Do you mind going over some basics? Touch on corrosion. Corrosion in any system is all about the breakdown of your vessel. Certain species within your vessel start to get leached out and you start to lose the integrity in some cases of your vessel. There are species in the molten salt, such as uranium, very slowly pulling out the chromium from your vessel system. That can have a number of effects, such as um, making your containment more brittle. So if you saw a spike in something that you weren't expecting, you'd be like, oh, hey, something just changed and this is most likely a concern. <laughs> yes, we can monitor for those quick changes, those off-normal conditions, so that we can inform operators, hey, something has changed, something's different. What's a fission product? Fission products are just what you get when uranium breaks up into other atoms. Many of them are radioactive. They themselves will then undergo radioactive decay to non-radioactive endpoints. Um, some of those products are bigger concerns than others, especially if they tend to volatize and go into the gas phase. So for example, iodine, that is a fission product, make sure that that is stationed away somewhere so that the people around a reactor are safe and not exposed to that particular species. We've got a strong signature and we've got a unique signature, which means we can uniquely identify the presence of I2 in the gas phase. Even more importantly, if we zoom in on some of those bands and we look at how those bands behave as we alter the pressure of I2, the partial pressure or concentration of it in the gas phase, we see that as we go from zero to higher pressures, that band grows in, which means we can take the intensity of that band, plot it as a function of the partial pressure of I2, and we can get a calibration curve indicating that not only can we identify the presence of I2 in the gas phase, but we can quantify it as well. Now, I2 is not the only potential species of iodine that we might see in the op gas. There will be others. We wanted to look at some examples, so we picked ICL. We got the beautiful signature that we can use to identify and quantify, but we also wanted to take the opportunity here to look at some of the other options that we have available to us. Raman is one form of molecular spectroscopy, but there's also FTIR. Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. It's very similar to Raman, very complementary, but you can get different kinds of information out of it. So we used this to look at ICL, and we of course got a very nice gas phase signature of ICL, but we also got a ton of other information that was pretty exciting. We could get the signature of the condensed ICL, and we could even get the signatures of HCL in there, which is a decomposition product of ICL. So we could get a ton of information out of this system right here and potentially have the opportunity to get even more, so other chemical species or indirect temperature measurements. So overall, we're showing that online monitoring based on optical spectroscopy for molecular characterization is a powerful route to give us information about the molecular species in the gas phase. And there are a lot of ways for us to provide this type of information. I showed you Raman and FTIR. You can build systems that focus on one 
the other, both, whatever. They're both mature. They're both commercially available. Testing the equipment is what we did this year. Next thing is to actually design the system that will take that spectral data that we're collecting and turn it automatically into information that operators can use. Now, the example I'm showing you here is not from the off-gas stuff. This is a demonstration that we did at PNNL. Those circle squares and triangles represent grab samples. Every time we grabbed a sample and sent that off to the lab for analysis, those numbers line up very nicely with what we were measuring online. We're very accurately measuring the concentration and composition of this stream. Even more exciting, our online monitoring results were coming out every 30 seconds. Every 30 seconds. We could tell you how much plutonium was in that stream, how much uranium. Those grab samples didn't come back for two weeks in the best case scenario, some of them even longer. All this work that I'm talking about really comes with the goal of supporting the efficient design, licensing, and deployment of molten salt reactors. We go to the Thorium Energy Alliance conference, and um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, some of us get pretty frustrated at times about opportunity of what molten salt reactors represent to how we feel that it's not going as fast as we'd like. Well. <laughs> There is sometimes a lot of pushback against nuclear, and it comes from a lot of different fields. Um, I think for a long time, one of the biggest troubles that nuclear had was public opinion. But what's very exciting is that I think we're starting to see that public opinion shift. I think people are starting to understand that energy is something they absolutely have to have. We cannot live without it. Um, but where we get our energy from is important, especially as we start considering um, responsible use and climate change and environmental factors, we need to take a good look at where our energy is coming from. And folks are starting to realize that, yes, renewable, solar, wind are very important, very useful, but we have to have something there to meet those base energy needs. And nuclear is the, nuclear is the option. Um, I think we're certainly starting to see folks from younger generations build more support for nuclear. My brother-in-law, he's several years younger than me. We were chatting and I said to him, uh, hey, what do you think about nuclear? Um, expecting him to have kind of the standard negative public opinion. And he, he it was so funny because he, he perks up, he's like, nuclear is the only way we can solve our energy problems, man. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's fantastic. You're probably also optimistic because you're actually working on the problem. You're, <laughs> you're actually doing the work every day. Nuclear absolutely has to be a part of a diverse energy portfolio. You can't be 100% nuclear, just like you can't be 100% hydro or 100% wind. You have to have all of the above in there um, to make a complete picture, especially a complete picture that can keep a nation of our size going. I certainly think that supporting nuclear is important, and I certainly think that that's what the work I do does, is it supports nuclear as an energy industry. Energy is something that we use in our daily lives, and having abundant, affordable, and reliable energy is something that's absolutely essential, not only to maintain the type of lifestyles that we have here, but we can start sharing this type of bounty, this type of experience with folks who don't have that energy, that economic stability, that social stability. And so nuclear can really start answering that. I absolutely love going to work. I, I love doing what I do, um, going into the lab, and working with plutonium, uranium, these other species. It's hard to show that people are actually doing this stuff in labs. If you contrast that with NREL, wind turbines and stuff, all these shots of wind turbines. I'm just throwing it out there that you might want to uh, just shoot a lot of video with your phone and post it online and let people know. I'll see if I can encourage my students. I don't know if I'm quite cool enough to uh, post those videos myself. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for taking so much time to this.